Dziękuję. Po pierwsze chciałbym podziękować za zaproszenie pani doktor Laskiewicz i całemu zarządowi e, za zaproszenie tutaj i chciałbym też dodać, że jestem e, e, unikalnie nie jestem lekarzem, więc też dziękuję za to zaproszenie z tego powodu. Jedyny chyba, który nie jest. Um, I'm going to tell you something about our research, um, but before I do, I thought I would I'll tell you about the place that I work in, in case some of you haven't heard of it before. So this is a new institute, the Francis Crick Institute. You can see some images here at the front of the building and the interior. Is it working? Again, some images from inside it. It was founded jointly by the Medical Research Council, so that's government money, Council Research UK and Wealth and Trust, two charities, and three universities, Imperial College, uh, UCL and King's College, uh, all put in money to build the building. And uh, the mission of the Crick, broadly, is to discover biology underlying human health with the aim of improving treatment, diagnosis, and prevention of human disease, and also generating economic opportunities for the UK. It's a very broad remit. And this we achieve through a very broad range of science that we do in this building. There are about 1,500 people, or will be when it's full, it's not quite full, 1,250 research scientists. We are, we think, the biggest biomedical research institute in one building in, the, in Europe. And of course, we have state-of-the-art facilities combining life science research with uh, physical sciences, so chemistry, physics, computer science, as well as uh, with, with medicine. We have a number of clinical uh, researchers working in the building. So switching to the topic uh, that I wanted to, uh, to uh, share with you is some of our research on Down syndrome. So what is the syndrome? Of course, you'll be aware that this is a human condition resulting in learning and memory difficulties and many other symptoms. It's named after John Langdon Down, a uh, English physician of the 19th century who was interested in learning difficulties and noticed that there was a group of children with particular facial features who also showed cognitive impairment and he recognized that there was a similarity there and that became known as uh, Down syndrome named after, after him. But it took another 100 years before we understood the genetics of this and it was work of Martha Gauthier together with Jerome Lejeune and uh, Raymond Duffin in uh, Paris in 1959 who realized that everyone with Down syndrome had an extra copy of chromosome 21, trisomy 21. So instead of two, having two copies, they had this third chromosome. So that is, of course, the genetic basis of it. In more global terms, um, Down syndrome causes a very substantial health burden. The estimates are around one in 750 births worldwide. It accounts for quite a lot of miscarriages. Despite uh, increasing uh, prenatal diagnosis, uh, the incidence is not decreasing, and there are many reasons for this. It depends on the country uh, concerned, but increasing maternal age uh, is a major factor, since that is the essentially the only known risk factor for, uh, for Down syndrome. Additionally, improved medical care means that people with Down syndrome are now living into their 60s. They used to die maybe uh, in their 30s, but uh, over the last 30 to 40 years, there's been an enormous improvement in in care for people with Down syndrome. And that's revealed that by the age of 50, around 50% of people with Down syndrome have Alzheimer's disease, or a senile dementia that's very similar pathologically to, Al to Alzheimer's. And it's estimated that probably if they live long enough, at the time they're 70 or 80, all of them will have Alzheimer's. There's an extraordinarily high rate of, of this uh, condition. And of course, as you will, will understand, people reaching the age of 50, at this time, they may well have elderly parents who themselves need care, whilst they, well, they're beginning to develop dementia, so this is a double problem. Elderly parents trying to look after children who are developing dementia. The uh, syndrome is very complex in the sense that it causes many different phenotypes, the penetrance of which varies. So essentially everyone with Down syndrome, we think, will develop Alzheimer's disease eventually. They all show some uh, level of learning and memory deficits, although the severity of this varies from mild to severe. 
and they, show, they all show muscle weakness to some extent. Other, other aspects of the syndrome are, um, are, are variable, and I'll just point out this one, which I'm going to talk about a bit more later, which is congenital heart defects, which affect around 40 to 50 percent of babies with, um, uh, with Down syndrome. So what is it? What causes these phenotypes? Well, obviously it arises from an extra copy of human chromosome 21. The sequence of the chromosome has now been known for many years, shows around 230 genes that code for proteins. There are other things there, non-coding genes, but a simple uh, analysis shows around 230 genes. And the uh, prevailing hypothesis, which I would ascribe to, is that this is a gene dosage disorder. That is to say, an extra copy of one or more of the genes on chromosome 21 causes the health deficits of Down syndrome. It could be one gene, it could be many genes, the different phenotypes could be due to different combinations of genes, and that is yet to be discovered. So the question that we're interested in is how does Down syndrome arise from trisomy 21, and specifically which genes are responsible for which features, and then how does increased dosage of these genes lead to pathology? So why would we be interested in knowing this? Well, if we knew which gene or genes caused the specific deficit, and we knew how that happened, we could think about rational therapeutic approaches. And, uh, and you know, I don't need to add that basically therapeutic options for Down syndrome are very limited. For example, for the cognitive impairment, there's no, there's no effective uh, uh, therapy at this point in time. So how might we find the relevant genes? Well, here's the scale of the problem. So on the left is a cartoon of chromosome 21. It's around 50 megabases in length. That's the short arm, the centromere, and the long arm. The short arm is highly repetitive DNA, and there's very few genes on it. Most of the genes sit on this long arm, and here they are, around 230 or so genes. So somewhere in there is one, or there is one, or there are more than one genes that cause each of these different phenotypes. So how might we find them? Well, the approach that we've been taking is to use uh, uh, the mouse as a model to uh, address this problem. So why is this, a, why is this a reasonable thing to do? Well, of course, the mouse, like human, is a mammal. It's separated from humans by around 80 million years of evolution. That sounds like a long time, but it's not that long in evolutionary terms. So around 99% of human genes are also find, found in mice. Um, and then, very importantly for us, uh, there are very sophisticated now genetic engineering techniques that are available to engineer mice to have specific genetic combinations, and that's critical for the research that I'm about to describe. So, how could we do this? Could we simply make a trisomic mouse? Well, we can't because there's no one-to-one -one equivalent of the chromosome. So, it turns out that the genes on chromosome 21, because of shuffling of chromosomes during evolution, are now located on three separate regions, on three different mouse chromosomes, chromosomes 10, 16, and 17, the so-called orthologous regions uh, in, the, in the mouse gene. And that's illustrated here. So here are the human chromosomes. There's chromosome 21, which I should say, by the way, is the smallest chromosome in terms of, um, in terms of the number of genes. Chromosomes were numbered originally based on, um, on, on their appearance on, on microscope slides. And so 22 was thought to be smaller, hence the numbering. Um, in fact, in gene dosage, in gene content, it's 21, which is the lowest. And that's almost certainly the reason why this is a trisomy that is compatible with life, actually. There are two others, 13 and 18, that also come to term that they're very severely disabled. Um, this is the only trisomy that makes it to adulthood. Um, so the genes in the mouse are now scattered on these three chromosomes, mouse uh, chromosome 16, 17, and 10, the little red boxes show that. And here in this cartoon, I've lined up the long arm of uh, chromosome 21, which is where almost all the genes are, and here are the regions of morphology. So there's this very large region on mouse 16, and then these two shorter regions on mouse uh, chromosome 17 and 10. So we can't do it with one chromosome, but what we can do is we can engineer mice to have an extra copy, a duplication of each and every one of these regions, and therefore have an extra, a third copy of the relevant morphologous regions. And so that's what I'm going to describe. Um, so here we are again human chromosome 21 with its three uh, orthologous regions. And we've generated a mouse that we call uh, dp one uh, tib This has an extra copy of the 23.9 megabases of mouse chromosome 16 that is orthologous to human 21. So here's a normal mouse chromosome 16. It turns out that this segment of DNA is actually right at the telomere of the, at the end of the mouse chromosome. And we've generated a mutant chromosome 
but has an extra copy, a tandem duplication now of this region. So the mouse, of course, will have two copies of chromosome 16, and in this strain, the DP1 did strain, there are two copies of every gene, except for the bit for the red bits, where we now have three copies. And there's around 150 genes in that. So it covers most of the, not it covers the majority, but not all of the autologous genes uh, to human 21. But this isn't all we've done. So we've made here, I flipped, flipped the, uh, the picture on its side. Now we're back in the vertical uh, orientation. Here's human chromosome 21 again, the autology with mouse 16. And this black line represents what we, the increased copy uh, of genes that we have in DP1 TID, the whole region of mouse morphology. Um, and but, so that's, so we made this mouse, but in addition, we've started to break this up into smaller regions. So in this case, the numbering doesn't matter, it's to do with the order we made them in the lab, but um, the uh, mouse range called DP9, DP2, and DP3, which break this up into three smaller regions. Then this we've broken up yet further, this last one here, DP3, we've broken up into DP4, five and six, ever smaller regions, and we've now, I'm not showing them all, we've also broken up these other intervals into, into shorter regions as well. And what this does, it provides us with a genetic mapping panel, which we can use to find dosage sensitive genes that cause specific Down syndrome phenotypes. So the way this works is that we would analyze one strain, for example, this DP1 uh, TID strain, and ask, does it have a specific phenotype? So if it does, okay, I'm gonna make it light up in red, it has a phenotype. So then we look at the three that break this down, the DP9, 2, and 3, and let's say for the sake of argument that it's DP3 that has a phenotype, that's in red now, so then we go on and we look at the even smaller ones that have even fewer genes as a third copy, and if for the sake of argument DP5 shows a phenotype, then we would say there must be at least one, perhaps more, dosage sensitive genes sitting in this interval. And these intervals are now down to about sort of 12 to 15 genes, so that becomes quite manageable in terms of now searching through them for a candidate positive genes. So we've been, with, in our lab, and also with many collaborators, we've looked across at many different phenotypes, and I don't have time to describe any but one of those, but here's a sort of list. We've looked at cognitive deficits, and these mice have that. There are changes in electrical activity in the, in the hippocampus of the brain, in measure coordination, heart development, facial changes, and uh, we have effects on neurodegeneration. So, but I'm just going to focus on one of those, and that's our work on heart development uh, in these animals. So, the normal heart, of course, the normal mammalian heart, has four chambers, two atria, two ventricles, and the common congenital heart defects in Down syndrome fall into two classes, ventricular septal defects, a hole in the ventricular septum between the two ventricles, or atrioventricular septal defects, which are failure to form the correct atrioventricular junction, the atrioventricular cushions that come across and fuse and separate the atria from the ventricles, that process fails, and now you get communication between all four chambers. This, of course, is uh, far more severe than the, than the ventricular uh, septal defect because of the mixing of the, of the blood. And um, around, as I said, around 40 to 50 percent of babies with Down syndrome have some form of congenital heart defect. These two types are the most common. And the questions that we have are, can we model these heart defects in the mouse? And if so, what are the dosage sensitive genes that are required to cause this? And how might they cause pathology? And I'll just talk a little bit about our search for the genes. So for us, a key technology in this has been the use of something called high resolution episcopic microscopy, which I don't have time to describe in great detail, but basically it's a sectioning technique followed by imaging and then a 3D reconstruction of a whole heart. And here we're flying through, once we have this 3D model, we're actually flying through a mouse embryonic heart at 14 and a half days of gestation, about two millimeters from, uh, from one end to the other. And just a moment ago, we flew in through the aorta, through the aortic valve, looking down into the uh, left ventricle, that's the aortic valve, we're just uh, heading towards. I think now we're going into, I think, the vena cava into, uh, into the right atrium, I believe. But you get a sense of how detailed we, uh, uh, is the, uh, the uh, view we have of the heart. And that's essential for being able to type the type of congenital heart defects that we have in detail. So I wouldn't be telling you this if there wasn't some uh, positive punchline, if you like. We do, we do in fact have phenotypes, and we have uh, quite substantial ones. 
So when we look at this mouse, the DP1 tick mouse, which has this extra copy of the whole 148 genes, we see a clear increase in the rates of congenital heart defects, and specifically, so here are sections through those 3D uh, imaging uh, 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 images that we've taken. On the top line is a wild type, in other words, a control mouse. Here is the mute, one of the mutants, the DP1 tick mouse. Here in this image, you can see a ventricular septum separating the right and left ventricles, a clear muscular wall. In this example, this particular uh, uh, mouse, this embryo, had a ventricular septal defect. You can see a communication across here. In, uh, on the right-hand side, this is a different view. This is looking across from, uh, at the junction between the atrium and the ventricles, cutting across a transverse view of the heart. Normally, the mitral and tricuspid valves should be separated by a muscular wall, um, and that's the correct formation. Here, in this instance, we have a clear connection of the two valves with each other, and the two atrioventricular cushions, the superior and inferior, have yet to fuse. And this is a classic example of an ADSD, an atrioventricular septal defect. And that's what we see in these hearts. The red part of the bio represents this increase in these ADSDs, and that's for us the most important marker that we have got phenotypes. Notably, it does, it's not 100% penetrant. Not every mouse gets this, even though they are genetically, as far as we know, identical. They are, these are inbred mouse strains. So that's quite an interesting issue as to why we're on, why not 100%. Uh, I don't have time to, to discuss that in detail. So of course, we've gone now through the mapping process, asking where are the genes that cause this? So we looked at the three strains that break this down. And if we look at the GT9, mice that have all of these genes extra, no heart defects, we look at the um, DP2 strain, no significant increase in heart defects. However, when we look at DP3, lo and behold, that's where the defects pop up. So this is only 39 genes in this area. So we've already got it down to just 39 genes. Can we go any further? Well, yes, we can. Uh, from a collaborator, we picked up another strain. This one's called TS1RHR. It turns out it's slightly shorter. Uh, it has a duplication of genes that's slightly shorter both at the left and the right end by about eight genes and these mice don't have the congenital heart defects. So that immediately tells us that one of the causative genes must be either one of these two genes at this end or one of these six genes at this end uh, that is required in three copies. But then we've gone on to look at the three breakdown strains, so DP4, 5, and 6. And when we look at 4, there's nothing there. 5, no significant increase. 6, no significant increase. And none of these on their own is enough. And that tells us that there must be at least two causative genes that are driving uh, this phenotype. So then we did the obvious thing, we combined these, we combined four with five, five with six, and four with six, and only one combination works, and that's five with six. So if we have an extra copy of the DP5 region and of the DP6 region, now the congenital heart defects come back. And so that now tells us two things, firstly, one gene must be sitting in this DP5 interval, which has these 12 genes in it. So that's one of our causative genes is somewhere here. And the other causative gene must be in the DP6 region, but by the logic of what I just described, it has to be one of these last six, we think, that is present in DP6, but not in the TS1RHR strain. And we're now in the midst of testing candidate genes in these intervals to find the individual causative genes. There may still be more than two, but minimally, the genetics tells us there has to be two genes that are cooperating when present in a third copy to do it. So in conclusion, um, we've been able to show that mouse models can be used to model aspects of Down syndrome, including, I didn't show you the data, but learning and memory deficits, as well as heart defects. We can use genetic techniques to find the dosage-sensitive dosage genes that cause these phenotypes. In the case of the heart defects, we have a minimum region of 26 genes that's sufficient to cause the heart defects. Within the, this, there must be at least two causative genes. One lies in this list of 12, the other lies in this list of six at the, uh, at the kind of distal end of the chromosome. And with that, I just want to thank the people who did this work. This is, I have numerous collaborators who've worked on various aspects of it. Most important is Lizzie Fisher. She's a professor at the Institute of Neurology at UCL, with whom we've done this together for the last 20, I don't know, five years or so, uh, various aspects of the Down syndrome work. The work that I presented today was uh, driven by two postdocs, Eva Alana Ilola and Shannon Watson Scales, who made this panel of mouse strains, and then Eva's been concentrating on the uh, analysis of the heart defects. And with that, I thank you.